Hi, right, what's up? Tim Sykes here with Tim Gratani, the man. Yo, good to hey, see you. Good to see you. How long has it been? Was it like Italy last summer? I don't know. It's been I lose track. Time. Or the conference. So yeah, months. It's been a months. few months. Um, what have you been up to these past few months in 2019? Well, the most recent is that I have a son now. Ah! Yeah. Is his name Tim too? It is not Tim. You don't have to no, answer that. We, okay. did, we did not good. Tim. Good, because there's too many Tims. We got Tim Lento, Tim Bowen. There's a guy here at the inner circle named Tim too. And I'm like, stop with the Tims. So thank you for not naming him Tim. It's getting confusing. You got it. Good. How's it going so far? It's been good. Bit of an adjustment. But right? Yeah. Oh, That's, yeah. So we were talking about like fatherhood and trading. How does that work? I mean, mad respect to uh, everyone who makes it work for yeah. sure. It's, it's tough. Um, I think that, well, you know, like one thing I remember is one of the conferences last year, I was talking to somebody about it and they, they had saw, gone through the same thing where they were like, oh, I just had a kid and I wish I had taken time off right after it happened because uh, I guess it was just like, you know, the lack of sleep, it yeah, was too much, they took a bunch of losses. Yeah. So I kind of took that advice to heart a little bit. Um, I took all of April off. I barely traded in May. I just tried to show up a few times for the best setups. But I was looking at your profits. We're here in July and you've still made a million dollars. Most of that was January through March, but, but that's pretty freaking awesome. It was, it was, it was cool. Make... It was cool to get off to that good of a start this year because that took a lot of pressure off. But, um, but yeah, I got back to it full time in June, and uh, that was probably the biggest adjustment because, you know, you're working from home. You kind of feel like you have your priorities a little backwards almost. Like I, I almost felt a little guilty trading where I was like, oh, I should be helping. I should be spending time with my son and. Uh, what that led to was the feeling of, well, if I'm going to be trading, I need to make it worth it. You know, I, I need to make something happen. Oh, so I, no. didn't, I didn't you sit here trades? and be break even all day. Oh, I forced trades. No, oh, yeah. not and Gritani. I was, I was, it happens to Gritani. <laughs> it can happen to anybody. I was lucky that it didn't lead to any huge losses or anything like that, but it was a lot of paper cuts. Yeah. And so what happened the first three weeks of June was I think I was about forty thousand dollars red. Yeah. Where, you know, I, I was love just, that forty thousand dollars is 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 paper cuts. People, well, most people watching this forty thousand dollars, they're devastation. When right? you've taken a two hundred ninety thousand dollar loss in one trade, it's 40, all 40, easier. 000, yeah. So I mean it was just a lot of small stuff that added up. So gotcha. it it took some time to kind of mentally write myself and kind of take that pressure off. But yeah. once I did things got back on track. Um June, I, I salvaged green in June, which was nice. And then uh, July, I think it was a slow first week, and then last week was one of my best weeks of the year. So oh, that yeah? was cool. How yeah. much last week? Uh, 160,000. 160,000 yeah. in profits last week. You were down 40,000 when you had kind of a, a mindset malfunction. Mm -hmm. We can call it that. Yeah, right? that's absolutely what it was, yeah. Um, now, what are you at total? Because a lot of people are just confused because we have different videos. Like, yeah. what, what have you done now? What is your total profit? Uh, I, I'm updated on profitly through the end of June, and I think it was about 8.4 million. So it's probably like 8.5, 8.6 right now, 8. somewhere 5, in there. 8.5, 8.6 million. Yeah. Starting mm -hmm. with just a few thousand dollars. Right, right. Very different now versus then. Yeah, it's changed a lot. But you're still having mindset, like, it can still happen. Like, oh, like, you I'm never glad, get over it. Yeah. I'm glad that you it's, mentioned this, because some people think, like, oh, you've, you've, like, evolved this. You're, like, a superhuman now. But when, you know, fatherhood or life gets in the way or, or anything, or even if it's a slow market or a different market, it still takes adjusting. It's a career long battle. Like you're never gonna reach the point in your career where it's like, oh, the emotion is totally out of it. Or, yeah. or like I've totally conquered trading psychology. Yeah. Like the second you like let down your guard or get lazy, the like will it's humble gonna, you. yeah, the you're gonna get humbled. humbled. And the it's happened to me, you. I've been doing this for eight years now yeah. and it happens again and again and again. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm lucky that it's gotten less painful as time has gone on. I, I haven't taken any six figure losses in How years. How have you done but... that? No, because I just posted that on Instagram because I had a $500,000 loss and I was like, I never want to feel that again. So I've taken losses, but I've really clamped down on that. How have you clamped down on losses lately? Um, I mean, it was, wow, what year was it? I can't remember when I made these YouTube videos, but I, I remember going through the whole process probably three years ago where it was, it was after my third six figure loss where I was like, enough is enough. Like, why can't I fix this? Cause you and feel so, terrible. So I sized way down and basically had to earn the right every month to size up a little bit at a time. Yeah. And I, I was logging a mistakes journal where, you know, not, not every loss I took, but every time I felt like I either got stubborn or played too large yeah. or just broke some key rule. And, you know, I would look at my tally marks at the end of the month and if it was 
you know, if it was too many tally marks, I had to stay where I was in size. And if I had done a good job that month, you I would reward myself, yourself. I'd go five hundred dollars more gold risk star. Per Do you have little my, stickers? My version of gold star was I could up my risk a little bit. Gotcha. And that was reward enough. Um, Should I give out stickers to students? Should maybe? I be like like you? Review your trades, and if you do well, you get like a little. You gotta, you gotta mail little stuffed ducks, like, like Michael Goodman. Yeah, right. Yeah. Something like that. Right. But I like that you you mention you know you you have a tally marks. A lot of people judge their mistakes only by their losses, and I like to talk about how even if I have a profit, I can still make mistakes. Maybe I oh, took yeah. profits too closely, too quickly. Maybe I was too aggressive. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Where Definitely. the mistakes can be made anywhere. Anywhere, yeah, and you've got to be honest with yourself on the trades, like when you're looking back on it. It's and they not, should be it's not the, Yeah, it's not, it's not whether it was a profit or a loss. It's, you know, you look at your process and how did you get to that end result? Like, Thank you for saying this. It's so tough because sometimes I say, like, I took a loss, but it was a good loss. It was best case scenario. And then I get, like, some trolls and they're like, how is a loss a good loss? Like, what are you teaching? But that's the reality of the situation. Sometimes, you know, stuff happens. You can't control it. All you can do is focus on your risk, focus on following your plan, and that's a good loss. Definitely. Right? Definitely, yeah. And sometimes you have a game, but you shouldn't have been in that trade. Maybe you broke a few rules, and mm -hmm. that is a bad game. Yeah. It's not just about profit and loss. And this is, how do I get people to understand this? Because they're very focused on money, right? Oh, yeah. I know that you turn off your profit and loss um, column. You know, I was actually mentioning that today. I made like two grand. I sold a little too soon, then I sold actually pretty well. Stock tanked by the end of the day in TTCM. <laughs> I was happy with that because I sold near the top. But I could not, I can't turn off my profit and loss thing. How do you, how do you not turn off your profit and loss column but still judge a trade based on your own plan and execution rather than just money? Well, I think, I think the first thing is you got to kind of, expand your mindset a little bit like you're not just focused on what are today's results because it's really easy to get caught up in that like you want every day to be green you want to feel like you had a nice win today but really i've always tried to think more in weeks or think in months um so that one day i don't like cave into that pressure feeling like oh i've got to make something happen yeah um and when you widen that mindset that's when you'll start to also notice mistakes a little bit more because um you know you get to the end of a day and you're not, you're not just like, oh, okay, I was green and I'm happy I'm green, but I broke three rules along the way. Um, because that's going to catch up with you at the end of a week or at yeah. the end of a month. Because sure, that one trade worked out, but you know, three, four, five trades later at the same setup, if you're doing the same thing, you're probably going to be red overall. So, so you kind of have to look at a, a wider, bigger you know, data set. Mm -hmm, exactly, yeah. So when you were losing your six figures, and you, know, you and I have talked about this in previous videos, we're actually going to post some videos, well, some previous interviews, where you were heading towards those losses, even though you didn't have the big losses yet, you had the bad um, kind of discipline and the, oh, yeah. you know, talk about that. So, percent. you know, the, like, you know, this ties into what I was talking about. Um, I was looking at it in a daily way back then where I would, I would have a green day and another green day and another green day. And I'd be like, wow, I'm on this great green day streak. I don't want to break that streak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then well, the comes the six figure loss and I've wiped out three weeks of gains. So that's what I mean by kind of expanding what you're looking at and what you're thinking about. I like baseball analogies, so I compare it to like, you know, a pitcher going into like the seventh or eighth inning with a no hitter and thinking, oh, just like one, two, three more innings, and then I have a no hitter. And then they change the way that they're pitching because they're thinking about their no hitter. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. And you know, to keep going with that analogy also, a lot of times what you see with those pitchers and those no hitter situations is they give up the first hit and then they unravel. Yeah. And suddenly like they're down five runs. So it's a mental thing. Yeah, it's totally it's, a mental thing. Like it's the same pitcher, the same amazing skill, but it's purely mental. Yeah. And this is what I want you guys to understand. Like some people are like, what do you do after, you know, 13 losses in a row or 13 wins in a row? What do you do if you have a streak like that, good or bad? Um, you know, I honestly don't even think about it anymore. Like that's where I've gotten to like where I, I used to focus on that and I, I would be really proud of myself for having a streak, but then I'd get too caught up in it and that would lead to me doing something dumb. So now I don't, I don't really think about how many days in a row was I green? How many trades in a row was I green? Um, I'm really trying to start every day as a blank slate. And, uh, this week's a great example because Monday I had a really bad day trading. I made four or five trades. I think I lost every single trade. A couple of them I got a little frustrated, sized up too big. So it was a pretty ugly day on Monday. And How much Tuesday, did you lose? Uh, it was like probably about 50000 And Tuesday I came out and just was really relaxed and just completely treated it like a fresh day. Like I was not thinking about making back all of the day before. Yeah. 
there was a good setup I had been in overnight. The stock gapped up nicely for me, and I made back three quarters of Monday. Crazy. Like, and, I, and I wasn't holding on to that trade like, oh, I need to get back to break even on the week. You were just, I sold when it was time to sell. Yeah. Like, I, I was actually out near high a day, which was really cool. So, so you're just doing, you know, finding your groove again, not thinking about the $50,000 loss. Yeah. And in the past, I would have gotten really torn up about that big red day. Yeah. And I would have had revenge on my mind. I would have had getting back to even on my mind. And it was just kind of nice to be to the point where I've matured a bit and just almost didn't even care. You know, How do you like, speed up this maturity level? Because now you're nearly a decade in, you see this as a marathon, not a sprint. You're focused on the process, you're focused on the big scheme. But as a newbie, when you have, think about like most people watching this, they have friends, family, like being like, why do you, your penny stock trading, it's a scam. Yeah. Like, and so in their minds, they have to make money right away to prove it. Not because they're bad people, not because their friends and family are, you know, bad people. They're just wrong and that mindset creates this kind of force It's a training. pressure. It puts on a pressure. How sure, do we yeah. get people to overcome that pressure? I mean, we're talking about it. This is good. You're over that pressure. Yeah. I'm over that pressure. But you've been trading nearly a decade. I've been trading two decades. How do we get someone trading one, two, three years not to feel that pressure as much? Oh, I wish I had an easy answer for that. Um, I mean, all I can say is trust the process. Yeah. Like, you know, just like I've been saying, like, just expand your mindset. Don't think about today. Think about this week. Think about this month. Think about this year. Um, don't don't let one day of results, you know, throw you on tilt or anything yeah. like that. And this is why I say it's a marathon, not a sprint. This is why I say have a big goal at the end where, you know, what can you do today, this week, this month to be in a good position one, two, three, five years from now. And I know that's not what people want to hear. They're just like, I don't care about five years from now. I want the hot pick today. Yeah. But you have to look at this. If this is going to make you some, you know, serious money, life changing money, it's going to take several years. You're not going to make life changing money on any one trade. Right. And I, I don't know how to like actually make people accept that. It, it's such a hard thing. Well, it kind of goes about. against like human nature to a it's degree. It's very counterintuitive. The yeah. best trading lessons are very counterintuitive, but just us talking about it. Cause I talk about this all the time, but they're kind of tired of me talking about yeah. it. So like, this is example a, right? Like exhibit right. a, may it please the court. Like, that I think is the biggest thing where you just have to wait for trades to come to you. You know, mm -hmm. this is a big thing too. Everyone's like, okay, I, I, I believe you, Tim uh, Sykes, you know, I, I want to trade. I'm taking Tuesday off from work. What should I buy? What do you, what do you say to yeah. a message like that? If you say like, let's say you get this DM on Monday and someone's like, okay, I'm taking the day off. I'm going to trade tomorrow. What should I do? I would ask them, what are your favorite setups? And I would say, look for one of those setups. That's, that's what I would say. What if like, they don't know any favorite setups? And I would say probably study more before you start trading. <laughs> this is why I like, always say study more. It all is connected because a lot yeah. of people, they don't know what their favorite setup is. So even if let's say there was a perfect setup, right? Perfect OTC, multi-month breakout, big volume, news catalyst, hot sector, hot market, you know, volume just exploding, everyone loving it. And a lot of people miss it because they don't understand like a multi-month setup. Did you see TTCM the other day? I didn't, no. Did you, did you, have you seen it lately? I have haven't. seen it now? I know, I haven't been so looking. So I bought a sub penny stock, which I, uh, I hate. It was actually, okay. it wasn't sub penny when I bought it. It was sub penny to start the day. Okay. But it was a multi-month cup and handle. They have this augmented reality network. It's probably crap. It's probably gonna fail. But massive volume, 100 million shares plus traded every day. Those are fun. And, Those I, bought the breakout, and I bought the breakout on a Friday afternoon. It was already up, I think 50 or 60%, but it finished mm -hmm. up like 70%. Gapped up a little on Monday, came down nearly green to red, then it spiked another 70% on Monday. But OTC, multi-month breakout, you love those. I do, yeah. I love those. And I had such a yeah. small dollar size position because I'm just, I'm not comfortable with low price stocks. Um, what is your sweet spot? Because I have like, a sweet spot. With a trading setup? Yeah, if you can name like a trading setup, your, your perfect trading setup. Um, oof. Let's see, I mean, it always changes. TTCM There's... was one of my perfect setups. It was a little too low price, but Multi-month cup and handle breakout. I bought just over the previous high. Massive volume with a news catalyst, with you know a hot sector, hot technology. So like a product that can span like all over social media. 
Um, you know, the tweets were going crazy. I think there's, yeah. I think there's a hundred thousand messages on the investors hub message board. Wow. Remember investors hub? I do remember investors God hub. God bless yeah. you investors hub trolls. Like they're just <laughs> hyping it up. Like well, I, I see tweets like I'm not selling the stock is trading at, was it trading at a penny by the way. Okay. I bought it at a penny. It's now at like two, two and a half cents nice. um, or 2.3 cents today. Yeah. It was a good little breakout, but people are saying, I'm not going to sell until $200. That's what Facebook is at. So it's oh, trading wow. at two cents. Wow. This kind of hype, this kind yeah. of, by the way, it, this is not a good company. Their augmented reality network will most likely fail. I'm sorry. It's probably not going to $200 a share and there's 2.6 billion outstanding shares. Already. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. So it's already, <laughs> like even if it goes to a dollar a share, that's a two plus billion dollar company. Yeah. So it's ridiculous, but that's, it's a fun set up for me because I've seen so many OTC multi-month breakouts like this. It's right. been a while, frankly, there hasn't been that many. What's your ideal setup lately? Lately on the yeah. long side, my ideal setup is probably something that's really low float, um, listed stock that is having a breakout. So yeah. same, same sort of idea is yeah. like an OTC breakout, but uh, I, I do have to pay attention to that share count and that share structure because um, you know, that's where they really get volatile and crazy, where you see the stuff go from like, you know, $3 to $6 or something. So I'm glad you brought this up because this has been a big trend that I've noticed. And, you know, I've been talking about how you have to adapt to different trends. Um, you know, weed stocks aren't as hot as they once were. Bitcoin right. isn't as hot. CBD isn't as hot. Right now, I think the biggest trend, well, let me hear what you think the biggest trend in 2019 has been. So far, probably yeah. just crazy low flow runners and then getting crushed right back down. So what I would say, I agree, same exact trend. And I say that is a short squeeze. I oh, say yeah, there usually. are massive, massive short squeezes from like CEI, BPTH, um, all this junk OAS and like all this stuff that's just such junk patterns. And because they have such bad long-term charts, a lot of shorts enter and they're mm -hmm. like, oh, it's going to come down and eventually it comes down. But yeah. what we've seen is they're spiking a lot more first. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's definitely my sweet spot right now is like, Did you I, trade BPTH or CEI during BPTH was earlier this year, right? Yeah. Yeah. I traded BPTH a lot. That um, was what? Two to 78 in a few days. Uh, yeah. It took like a week to play out. I yeah. think because yeah. I remember I, uh, I don't think I longed it the first time. I, I shorted it like that first red day and made a bid on it from what I remember. And then I bought it when it broke out past that initial high a few days later. Yeah. And I didn't make it as far on that as I would have liked price wise, but I still, I think I made like 40 or 50,000 on the trade. To so. be fair, that is like- It was like a black swan. Yeah. yeah was, that does not very happen rare. very often. Yeah. Lily here, who's with us here in Chicago, she had uh, 2,000 shares, she said. I think at 11 ish on that breakout and the next day it gapped up to 17 pre-market yep. and she sold and she made like 10,000 and she was so happy. And then later that morning it was in the thirties, forties, fifties, sixties. And I was like, you don't, don't regret that. I think that. my trade was like, similar. I think I was long overnight and then out into the gap. Cause I was like this, how do I not take this? Yeah. And then it goes another 50 bucks. So this whatever. is the thing. So this is a trend that's happening right now, but don't try to say, okay, this is the one that's going to go from two to 50. Cause this is another mistake that I see people making. Like this is definitely the one that's going to go full supernova. And I'm just like, maybe it will, but you know, yeah. we can count on two hands, all of the biggest supernovas in the past like yeah. year. So you can't really go for that. That said, we both recognize that trend. And so you can play it along the way. You know, I've right. taken five, 10, 15, 20% moves when the stock spikes a hundred, 200, 300%. Yeah. What do you think about short selling right now? Um, let's see. I mean, you gotta be careful. <laughs> that's a big question. You gotta be careful. That's for sure. Cause like you said, like a lot of these big low flow runners are short squeezes. So, um, I try I, to be really cautious about not being early getting in on these. Well, here's the interesting thing. So what I've noticed, and I rarely short sell these days cause I think the risk reward has flipped, you know, back when you first started stocks would maybe go from one to four and then come back down, right? Maybe one to three and come back down. But now you're seeing stocks that can squeeze one to 10, one to 20. And you know, frankly, newbies, they're just not prepared. It's like a deer in headlights. Yeah. With, with especially the beginner mindset, you get to a point where you say, oh, it's up too much. And that is a really dangerous and thing. And then to think. I see a lot of chat rooms are like, but this stock has warrants, but the fundamentals are so bad. And they start trying to value the company while it's in the midst of a short squeeze. Yeah. Valuation does not matter when there's a giant short squeeze. Exactly. Yeah. Like I, I love, I love the ones that do have the warrants or some kind of dilution, but I agree completely. Like when the squeeze is going on, it doesn't matter. But you know, once we get to the backside of the move, then I really pile into those ones. Backside is fine. But yeah. a lot of people justify their early shorts by saying the fundamentals are bad. 
the financing is coming, and then you just set yourself up like you're shorting a stock at two, three, four, and it goes up to five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and yeah. you say the value is bad, the fundamentals are bad, and you're taking these 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 percent risk levels losses. Yeah. And eventually it does come back down. This is the heartbreaking thing. So short selling for me is like this crazy, like, you know, Shakespearean drama right now, because you might be right eventually, but you can't necessarily control or even understand how high it can go in the meantime. Mm -hmm. And then this is another problem. Okay. So you just say, okay, wait till the backside, but usually on the backside, there's no shares to short. So you have to, tougher, yeah. so you have to short early and risk a little pain, but then how do you, how do you risk your pain? Cause you don't know if it's going to be a little pain or a lot of pain. I mean, if it's me and I've got the shares early, like on day one, I box them up. Oh, you another... so you're boxing. I will. Yeah. Shh, don't tell no. them. Most people can't box. I don't, I don't buy into the short early and risk a little pain. I don't like that. Yeah. I, I don't want to risk pain. Yeah. Especially on something that's a dangerous low float. So. Cause you have no idea how high it can go. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, I, I like. I brought the... up DRYS. Remember DRYS? I remember DRYS. That was ridiculous. I, I had a tiny little short position at $15 and I was like, ah, oh, what could happen? And then next thing I know, I'm covering at 70. So <laughs> it was. <laughs> and that was the most that fundamentally flawed company. Financing, so much nastiness. And it I, came down eventually. I do like that. But it went up to over a hundred dollars. What was it? Five to one hundred and eighteen. And then all halts pre-market, like in the hundreds. And people and shorts got lucky. 20. Shorts oh, they got really got lucky. Shorts got lucky with that. Because really yeah. if it did not get halted at, well, I think it was a one eighteen when it got halted. It could have. I, I'm guessing it could have hit one fifty, maybe even two hundred. Definitely, that definitely. And um, that would have been like wiped out a lot of people. Yeah. And I do like that people are like looking more at fundamentals and trying to understand warrants and dilution and stuff like that. But is that for trading still... tickers too? We hear rumors of trading tickers too. Can you address the rumors? Uh, trading tickers too. There is not even an outline yet. So it's uh, it's one of those things where I think I think it's gonna happen eventually, but. We're not anywhere close. I texted him because the chat room, one of you guys started a rumor that trading tickers two was happening and it took off in the chat room. And I woke up, I was somewhere, some crazy time zone. And I had all these messages like, why don't you tell us about trading tickers two? And I was like, there's a trading tickers two. I don't even know. And so I texted him. I was like, why didn't you tell me? And he's like, what? And so this is how these rumors spread. Like yeah. he is busy. Let him be a father. Let him deal with his life right now. Don't rush it. Okay. Good. Don't it's okay. You can take your time. Yeah. People have a lot of information you have. If you're a trading challenge student, do you know how many webinars you've given? Uh, at least 30, right? I was going to say, actually it's 40 plus. Okay. So I was counting the other day and it's if, been a while. I need to get back to those. Yes. But also if you're a trading challenge student, this is a thing. How do we get people to watch the archive webinars? Cause they're like something from a year or two or three years ago. Doesn't apply to this market. Why should they study the past? Um, I would say because I still trade a lot of the same patterns. So it's, it's not like, oh, I'm a totally different trader now. You're going to be looking at things that are outdated and I never use. Like I, I still use most of my own setups. And I would also say even if it is a webinar on an outdated strategy, you still learn your history. It's like studying the Roman Empire, the Egyptian Empire. Like you have to know your stock market history because what we want, want you to understand is that it's not just memorizing a pattern or memorizing a strategy. It's understanding how this game works. How is a short squeeze created? That's why we're talking about this. Not just, oh, what's the next stock that's going to go from two to 60. Like if you learn the ins and the outs of shorting and you learn the ins and the outs of promotion and stuff like that, then you can start to formulate, oh, here logically is how this is going to play out. And then you might see, oh, this sector might start to get, you know, hot right now. Not because it's an amazing sector, an amazing stock, but just because these patterns play out. History plays out again and again, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, like if you look at a lot of the top strategies, they're not new strategies, right? Like a lot of the patterns that you make money on right now, they're not brand new. It's not like, Oh, I've seen a brand new pattern in 2019. No, like these short squeezes there, they might be more volatile than in the past, but we've seen short squeezes in the past. This isn't a totally new thing. It's just, you know, accentuated. Do you agree with that? Oh, completely. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen some, I mean, the, the breakout pattern or like the big start of the squeeze usually looks pretty similar to yeah. anything I've seen before. It's just, they're going further. Wait, I want to pull up this one year thing. Give them a talk just for a second. When you first started with like, you know, your first year, how did you learn so much? Because I often say, thank God you didn't make any money for your first nine months. Thank you for that. Yeah. Because now it gives people like, Oh, Britannia didn't make money for nine months. So I'm okay. But right. what were you doing though, doing those during those nine months when you weren't making money? 
Okay, so I, yeah, I got started in February 2011 uh, studying penny stock and silver. Yes. And for three months, it was just studying, no trading. And I was just trying to learn as much as I could. Um, I might have popped into other couple chat rooms as well. I don't know. Like, I was just, I was looking everywhere. I wanted to learn patterns. I wanted to learn everything. I wanted to just always have something I could trade pretty much. Like, I, every day I wanted to show up and be like, oh, I recognize this setup. I can make a trade. And I thought it would be really easy. I thought I'd make money really fast. I, I paper traded a little bit during that three months. And I think I was, you know, a perfect 12 for 12 or something like that. <laughs> so I was, I was super confident. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go. And then I put real money on the line. I think I lost on my first three trades. And uh, then it was just choppy. It was just choppy for a really long time. And the problem I eventually figured out was overtrading because... I was trying to do it all. Like every single day I was showing up and I had to touch something. I had to I had to try to play whatever was hot. I would see what people were talking about in a chat room and I would get excited about it and I would buy it. I would see what trade alert you put out, I would try to follow it. Never um, follow alerts! From me, from him, from anybody. We share the alerts, we share stuff in real time so that you can learn in real time. What is my thought process? This is why I spend so much time writing out a paragraph of why I'm in a trade as opposed to just buy this ticker, which is what a lot of chat rooms do. And I mean, I'm, I'm lucky I survived as long as I did like that because I think it was until about August or September of 2011 that I was about break even and then started taking the hits where, you know, I, I was a $1,500 account back then. I think it started with a $300 loss on some overnight OTC pump that I thought was going to gap up, you know, something I had no business being in in the first place. Yeah. And instead it gapped down. It was super illiquid. I couldn't get out. And uh, then that mentally messed me up. I got really freaked out because all of a sudden I'm down money. I start trying to short sell um, a pump and dump. I believe it was LBAS, I think. I don't oh, know if you remember that ticker. I do, yeah, it kept um, going. Yeah, it was like a dime to a dollar or something like that. And I kept thinking every day it was going to be the breakdown day. And so I would try to short it at like a dollar, it would go down two cents, then start to perk. I'd get scared, I'd cover it like 102 or 103. And I did this over and over and over and over again and just bled myself out. And so next thing you know, I don't have a $1,500 account anymore. Uh, and you know, during all this, I, I watched uh, Penny Stock and Part Two. I was watching video lessons. I was, I was really like making the effort to study and learn outside of market hours. But uh, I was just trying to do too much. And what turned me around was, you know, once I had that initial $1,500 gone, it was kind of like a wake up call that like, okay, what I'm doing isn't working. Why isn't it working? And that's where, you know, I had to get really honest with myself, really get critical of what my process was like, what I was doing. And uh, the one upside of trying to do it all is that I had a lot of results to look at. So I could kind of figure out data. what was I, yeah, data. What was I doing well? What was I doing poorly? And it came down to the fact that what I was doing well was buying breakouts and buying new promotions. So that became the focus. And when I, you know, I, I worked the summer job at State Farm that year, I, so I had the money to refund, thank God. Did you wear khakis? Uh, I don't Did think they I force you to wear khakis? There's, no, there was, there, was no, there was no khaki marketing okay, yet. Cool. Yeah. Just curious. Um, but I, I kept on, you know, I, I started back up with another 1500 and I just told myself I'm going to stick to these two setups. And... There were times where, you know, I would go two days, three days without making a trade. And that was really difficult. And that was very new to me because I just wanted action. And there were just were days the setup wasn't there. But how did you stay disciplined? Because this is a problem with a lot of people. Sometimes there's no great play and they're like, their money is sitting. Again, their friends and family are telling them like, you're wasting all this time studying. How did you remain on track? Did you have your friends and family? Were they supportive or were they like, you're, you're going crazy? Um... I mean, I don't really remember it being too extreme one way or the other, gotcha. to be honest. I, I think most people were just kind of indifferent. Fair um, enough. I, I was, you know, I was still away at college at this point, so... Um, but how did you personally have the fortitude to keep going? Because normally, you put it in It was months. those early losses. It was those early losses that did it. Because it, that really instilled a deep fear in me that I could fail. Because before, you know, going into it, you know, 12 for 12 on paper trades, I thought, no way I failed this, it'll be the easiest thing in the world. And then, you know, expectation meets reality. And I go through those months of break even and then a total breakdown and falling apart. And, you know, I'm in a major I don't really like and I'm already starting to think about how I do want to trade full time, but I'm no good at it yet. And so, you know, you, you take the losses and it really motivates you to change. Because well, what made you even like stick with it? Because most people have losses, they want to quit. 
Well, I, it helps that it was only fifteen hundred dollars, and that I wasn't trying to trade larger amounts of money because you know. Well, whether it's fifteen hundred or whatever, it's still demoralizing. Oh, it's demoralizing, yeah, but it's not like, you know, it, it's not like I was in debt or anything. Like, True. you know, I, I made like four thousand dollars that summer at State Farm, so it's not even. It's not like I lost my summer salary even. Like, it was a very recoverable amount of money. But was there ever a moment where you're like, okay, I'm just losing. Like, this isn't for me. Not there, no. Um, at that point in the career, it was like I'm, I, I recognized that I was still new, and I felt like I had an idea of what needed to be fixed. Because you had the right mindset that this is a marathon. Exactly. Yeah. Like it, it's. It's not like I had those losses and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong. You don't quit running a marathon after like two miles. Yeah, so... David it, Goggins teaches you to go. Do you watch David Goggins? No. You should. You'll, you'll laugh. I'll show you some. Okay, videos. show me some, yeah. He keeps going and it's like, it's a marathon, right? And so right. you kept going. How did you turn around? You just focused on these two patterns? I just focused on those two for a while, yeah. And, you know, but again, it all came back to the fact that I was able to be honest with myself and critical of myself. I wasn't blaming somebody else. I wasn't saying, you're giving bad alerts. I wasn't saying, um, you know, oh, short sellers manipulated this play and that's why it didn't go up. Like, you know, I, I took responsibility. And that's one of the biggest things you have to do is you have to be honest with yourself about what can you change. And so I felt like I had an answer to that and that's why I didn't get discouraged. Because do you agree the majority of this is, is people, it's you versus you. Like oh yeah, Opportunities 100%. are there, and then the question 100%. is, are you mentally there to take advantage of the opportunities? Yeah, I mean like you'll, I, I make the comparison here of like you'll see, an S, you'll see the SEC halt a stock and people will be stuck long in that. And they'll be like, oh stupid SEC, I lost because but it's of them. Their fault. And it's like, yeah, why were you in that in the first place? You were in something that was a halt risk. What can you do to make sure that doesn't happen again? Or you're, you know, short a stock and it keeps going. And yeah. you don't cut losses. Yeah, and then you exactly. blame others yeah. for buying oh, it. Yeah, oh, it's manipulated. Someone's supporting it. They created short squeeze. It's not my fault. No, it's your fault. Like, you got stubborn. So Every trade is you. It's you versus you. And you have yeah. to take responsibility. So you, you look in the mirror. You're honest with yourself. And you try to find answers to the problems that you're having. And that's why I didn't get discouraged. Because I thought I had answers. Um, you know, if I had failed again and again and again, then maybe I would have started to get discouraged once I felt like I ran out of ideas. But, you know, I, I never got to that point. Uh, the closest I ever came, actually, to being discouraged and like, oh, wow, do I have a future in trading was actually about three or four years in. You know, whenever I did take that string of six-figure losses yeah. where it was like, you know, it was, they got smaller every time, but still it was just... It got more painful every time. Even though the loss got smaller, the, the loss got more painful yeah, because of I felt so out of control. Yeah. And I was like, this is entirely a me problem and I thought I would have learned this lesson, but I didn't. Like, why can't I make this change? What made it stick the last time? Because it was just so big? I mean, no, the last one was about 105,000, which was less than half a lake. Okay. But uh, I think it was just, again, you know, the pain was the motivator, you know, the, the, the pain was kind of the motivator to stay disciplined after the $1,500 blow up and the pain of the third six figure loss was kind of the motivator to say like, I have to force myself to size down and fix these habits because I, I recognized it wasn't sustainable to keep trading like yeah. that and it was just so frustrating. Not sustainable in terms of financially sustainable and emotionally, I both. would say. Both. Oh yeah, both. You know, mm -hmm. like you don't, when you have those heartbreaks, like it's like your life is over. Even if you still have money, like, you know, when I had my $500,000 loss, I still had roughly four or $500,000 to my name. So I wasn't broke, but it was like humiliating. And it was like, yeah. wow, I'm dealing with a power that I can't control like I thought I could. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to feel that again. For sure. Right? Yeah. All right. I was looking up one thing. We got to keep moving in this, this talk. Um, I wanted you to look up this. I don't know if you've ever read this book. Have you read this book? The Intelligent Investor? I have not read this, no. Fantastic book if you want to learn about value investing. But just look, what year was it published? 1949. So this is the basically the Bible for value investors called The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. It basically describes Warren Buffett's strategy to a T. Um, and a lot of people question, why am I, like, why, why do I care about a video lesson made six or seven years ago or a DVD made six or seven? This book is 60, 70 years old and the strategy is all defined. The cool thing is that this is not rocket science. What has happened in the past happens again. Maybe the stocks go up a little more, maybe with pumps, like they go up less. Like the, we haven't seen that many promotions. Right. But you're not taking on uh, something that's totally new. This isn't like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a new invention. 
recently new, right? But they trade like OTCs. Yeah, but anything, you know. anything <laughs> can happen. Anything can happen with Bitcoin. But what I'm saying with these stocks and these patterns, it's not new. It's just, you know, variations of old stuff. And that's why it's important to study the past. Because yeah. I don't think too many people have studied. I've actually looked at how many people have studied your video lessons and your webinars. It's not many. Because hmm. they don't think like, oh, something from four years ago, it doesn't apply. But it does. I want them to study your entire journey. I want you them to study my entire journey because there are parallels from four years ago to now, you know, and like shipping stocks were hot once upon a time. Shipping stocks will be hot again. Chinese stocks were hot. Low flow stocks go get hot and hot again. What is your take on Bitcoin now that you brought that up? Because now I see you're <laughs> laughing about this. I'm well, curious. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I just think it's really funny because uh, I mean, I've still never traded crypto itself um, because I thought I hear I, horror stories. Be very careful. Well, I thought, I, I thought I'd go crazy if I tried to trade something that trades 24 seven. But true. 100 um, percent. I agree. I, I was laughing about it just because the chart patterns are so similar and so like technically pure compared to like what I started with, with OTC stocks. Um, Did you ever meet Harry Ye? He was one of my students. No. He traded stocks, but he transitioned fully to Bitcoin. And now he has all these cars. He posts, uh, he sends me pictures of his Lambos and stuff. And he's like, it's the same patterns that you teach. Yeah, How I crazy mean, is that? I, it is nuts. And I... I don't know, like it, it almost tempts me to get into it a little bit. I have no idea about the valuation of any of this stuff. Um, I I wouldn't even begin trying to guess like no. whether it's gonna be like a long-term thing or not. Yeah. But you know, if I'm seeing some, you know, crappy little crypto having some kind of a chart breakout, like I have a pretty good feeling the chart is gonna perform the way I would expect, you know, most any other chart to. For me, I like the crypto volatility because it also lends itself to crypto oh, related stocks. You know, that's, we, yeah, that's we right. traded Kodak, remember the Kodak GB, coin? GBTC, I traded a ton of that last yeah. November, December. Yeah. yeah, and now you have like little ones like MGI and you know, Riot, all these. Uh, yeah. yeah, like there's, there's a lot. Yeah, so I like crypto volatility, but I do want to put a big disclaimer right here be careful with crypto. Um, there are so many scams. You have so many questions regarding taxation. Um, so many questions regarding uh, different brokers. You know, brokers have been shut down like overnight. It doesn't matter how much you have in your account. For whatever reason, that exchange just gets crushed. Coinbase, there were problems. When it was going up so much, I heard uh, horror stories of people not being able to sell enough. Like they had limits wow. on how much you could sell, which is not wow. you know usual. So yeah. be very careful with crypto itself. And the 24 seven thing, I That's love rough. my sleep. I cherish my sleep. Yeah. You cherish your sleep oh, yeah. these days oh, too. Yeah. So 24 seven is very tough. Yeah. Um, let me ask you just one final thought. What can people do now you know, we're do filming this in summer of 2019. What can they do right now to really maximize the, the rest of 2019 and 2020 and beyond? Like if, if they were just starting like, oh, Tim Grittani, a few thousand into nearly 9 million, what do I do first? Start gathering data, honestly. Like data about what you're trading. Um, you know, if you make a, tr make a trade journal. Like if you make a trade, you need to be able to put in that trade journal what setup were you trying to trade. And then when you start to compile enough results there, you can start looking through them and saying like, okay, I'm great at shorting parabolics or I suck at buying breakouts. Like, you know, follow your results. That's really important. How many trades do you need before you can like make a conclusion? Cause some people are like, I've done this trade three times and it didn't work. Yeah, three is not enough. I mean. <laughs> I get these messages and I'm like, no, no. Like, cause they, uh, I, I applaud people who are on the right path, but they're like, I've yeah. done this trade four times and I only won once, it doesn't work. And I'm like, what kind of sample set is that? A four trades? Really? Right. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a magic number. I mean, but it's not I'd three or four. At least, at, yeah, not three or four, like at least 20, I'd say. But then part of that too is that you need to, you know, that like let's say you're trying to buy breakouts. You know, you need to track how do you do when you're trying to buy breakouts, but you also need to be tracking the setup itself, um, you know, independent of your trading of it. You know, like what price did it break out at? How high did it get? Was the breakout successful or was it a failure? Because if the setup numbers look really, really good, but your trading results look really, really bad, that means the problem isn't with the setup necessarily, it's with how you're approaching the setup. So I say it's kind of like a moving target because the market is moving and then you're moving and you're trying to get close to this moving target and you're over here. And so you have to try to get as in tune as possible. And every now and then you'll have like a perfect overlap, like where you'll understand the setup, you'll repeat it again and again and you'll win like, you know, 40 times out of 44 times and you'll yeah. be like, I get it. And then maybe the setup disappears and you have to be ready yeah. for another one. Like for me early on, um, 
what I ran into was I was trying to buy OTC breakouts and I was getting shaken out of a lot of them but ultimately they would run 30, 40, 50%. And so I had to kind of say like, okay, you know, these breakouts, they work. Why am I not in it? For it was the a meat you of the problem. Move? It was a me problem. It was that I was cutting the loss too soon because I was trying to, I was making the assumption that, you know, if a stock breaks out at a dollar, it's going to hold one dollar perfectly. It has to go. And the more of these I tracked, the more I started to see like, nope, it doesn't hold the dollar perfectly. It dips down to like 95 cents or something like so that. You you know? So So then I started using a little bit wider of a risk and giving the chart that little bit of wiggle room to shake a little bit. And then all of a sudden, I'm in it for these moves and these nice ramps up. So, and that's beautiful. So the strategy is there, and then you just have to try to get as close to it as possible to yeah. maximize it. And I, but I got there by tracking the data. You know, it was it was the reality versus perception thing. By like tracking I, and then adapting. Exactly. It's a two-step process. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's I not saved, just enough to track. I saved charts. I saved chart images. I put this into an Excel so I could see the numbers and the percentages. Like I was, you know, I did the gritty work after hours. And this is why I say you have to picture yourself as a scientist. You know, like you have to take at all of this data, look at it, and then try to make hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Like you basically, have to get your Bunsen burner out. Remember Bunsen burners in school? Did you use Bunsen burners. Uh, yeah. So I remember Bunsen, Bunsen burners. Yeah, I, I remember. They have yeah. House, like a yeah. fire risk. But no, like, I remember. you have to test. You have to do so many tests with different strategies and with you because you're different than him and I'm different than him and you're different. We're all different, so we have different strengths and weaknesses. So even a pattern that Tim Gritani might be nailing, you might suck at. And it's not that there's anything wrong with you. Right. You just have different strengths and weaknesses. Like For sure. A lot of people like shorting morning spikes. I suck at shorting morning spikes. The sh morning spikes that I short always just keep going. I mean, so I some, some people are able to short the backside of these really trashy parabolic moves and be patient for days. That's not me. Tim I can't Lento. do it. You know Tim Lento has made like a quarter of a million dollars and he holds oh, for nice. months. He holds yeah, for wow. months at Interactive Brokers. Wow. Right? And I'm just like, that's crazy. And yeah, that's his thing. Like, that's, I can't do it. I don't like, know. I, I, make it, I make it like two days max. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like, yeah. Right? Um, so you have to adapt. You have to collect the data. Then you have to look at the data. Then you have to adapt again mm -hmm. and again and again. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's a never ending process. It's never ending. And that's like the good and the bad. It's like the never ending story with Falcor. Do you remember the never ending story? I don't. Do you remember the never ending story? Falcor? You don't remember this? It's just like an 80s movie. It's cheesy. It's good. Watch the never ending story. Um, it literally. It never ends, but it does change. Now, what is next for you? What's your goals? Oh man, uh, well, that's a good question. I haven't thought too much about it. What? Look at this, <laughs> the no, ultimate okay, okay, guy. No, Look at all my data. I analyze every little thing. What's the future? I don't know how <laughs> that question caught me off guard. Okay, no, I've, I've, got, I've got some goals. Okay, tell me. So uh, one goal is I'm trying to automate a few strategies where uh, basically I don't have to be in front of the screen as much. The nice. computer will take care of it for me. Ooh. It's just kind of, you know, coding in those rules. Cool. Uh, you know, kind of the, the stuff that like Triforce Trader does. Yeah, yeah. Like that, I think that stuff's Are really Are you cool. personally coding now? Uh, not at that level. Like I, I've coded some stuff to like automate some of my spreadsheet tracking a bit, cool. which makes the after hour stuff go How many faster. spreadsheets do you have? I've got a big one right now. It's, you know, you, you used to say like I had a ton of spreadsheets and I was like, okay, you're exaggerating a little bit, but yeah. it's, it's starting to get there. Like, yeah. Cause, Cause I'm trying to learn new strategies yeah. too. Like right now I'm working on um, morning breakouts Nice. because I, I feel like I need more long setups in my arsenal. And uh, so like a morning intraday break past highs, I've been trying to put some hard data to that and figure out which ones work, which ones fail. And that's still a work in progress. Like it's, it's a lot, more of a toss up than I would have expected going into it. But, but I like that you're doing that. Like, even though you made $9 million, you're not like just sitting and resting on your laurels. Like you're still looking for new things. And this I is, like to have a project, yeah. But, but, but it's not even like, like you need to look at this because too many people, they're like, I have this pattern. I never need anything else again. What happens if the pattern disappears? Like people right. are not prepared for that. Well, I can't know, tell you I, how many Bitcoin people were obsessed with Bitcoin going to a million. They needed nothing else. And then Bitcoin did not go to a million. In fact, it dropped 80% and they're very sad. They had nothing else in the back. I mean, some of the fees with short selling have been getting more expensive. So it's like, that's another reason why I'm like, okay, I want to become a better long trader. Because, yes. you know, there's no, there's no locate fee for buying a stock. Correct. And you can get in and out again and again with shorts. Right, right. Yes, you can box, but you have the fees, you have the risk of squeeze. For me, I used to short all the time. If you look at my early video lessons, they're almost all short bias. But now I think the risk reward has changed and I've gotten much better at you know going long. 
One last question. I yeah. actually was looking at your uh, trades from 2019. You've mm -hmm. had two big long trades. Do you okay. know what, you, what are your two biggest long trades? Do you, let's see if you know them off the top of your Probably head. Probably don't. Is BPTH one of them? Nope. Really? 2019. Yeah. I mean, it's the same pattern, but your two biggest uh, long trades. SOLI? That was number two. Yeah. But number one is my same. We both have the single biggest long win and probably maybe different times, but same stock. What ticker? SHMP. Oh yeah, yeah, OTC breakout. Right? Yeah. So you bought the breakout and you held. Is did that I, right? I might have made it a couple days with that one, yeah. I did not, I missed the breakout and then I was like, I don't want to chase, I waited for the morning panic. And there was okay. one morning panic, it was so freaking beautiful, it dropped from like 90 or 95 cents down to 50 cents. I know what you're talking about. In yeah. a few minutes, and the volume was massive, I got a partial execution, I remember it specifically, 32,000 shares. Mm -hmm. I wanted like 150,000, but it, you know, I missed the turn. Um, I made like four grand, you made like 60 grand. Um, it's pretty crazy yeah. though, that you know we have different strategies, but we play similar stocks, and SHMP was beautiful. It was. Do you that, remember that? Oh, I remember it, yeah. I mean, the, I haven't seen an OTC like that in a while. We're gonna put and, the chart right here. But yeah, uh, I remember that one very well. I, I really was all about that breakout. Cause it was I a, it, it a multi-day breakout, then a big crash, then a big bounce. I missed the bounce. I was watching the same, I was watching for that same play as you too. I Huddy, wanted the bounce play, Huddy, I wanted it lower. I was just with Huddy in Greece the other day. He's doing good, he says hi. Yeah. And he's closing in on a quarter of a million dollars in profits nice. now too. Good for just Huddy. graduated college. Yeah. Made three grand when we were hanging out the day in Greece. He was Sweet. shorting SOLY. Um, but he nailed, actually, he was short SHMP that morning from 90 cents. I think he covered at 70 or 60. Oh, then he bought the dip, sold a little too soon, but then shorted again. And I think he made like 20 or 30 grand that day, Sick. which is big Sick. for him. But that is the kind of volatility that you look for. And if there's a blog post, I'll post a link below how Tim Bertani made $200,000 in a day. Do you remember that with Fannie, Fannie Mae? Mae? Yeah, Fannie Mae. That was this very similar, if not exact pattern. Fannie Mae was a bit smoother with the panics and bounces. But True. It, yeah. But it was the same pretty volatility. Much, pretty much the same volatility, yeah. Where you had the big morning spike, the big morning crash, the bounce, and then kind of the peter Trickle out, off, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. That yeah. is the kind of you know, price action that we wait for, that we that I dream about. I don't know if you yeah. dream about Oh, no, I do. These I are my that. dreams. Yeah. I'm like, just give me this price action. But we haven't seen that as of late. Like, you know. Not K in the OCC market. Really KBLB now. was a big winner from 10 cents to 50 cents, but it never acted like that, you know, well. Like, I loaded up. I, they had such a good press release at 10 cents. I loaded up. Big first green day. I was like, yes, this is it. And it did nothing on day two. And I got yeah. out. And then it spiked on day eight. And I was like, fuck this. <laughs> uh, day eight? Day eight yeah. break out? What? And then it went from 10 to 50, and back down to 20, and back to 50, and now it's back to 20. Mm. Um, how do people have the patience, and what do they do while waiting for this kind of price action, this perfect price action, for longs and shorts? I mean, if you've got one or two setups you're good at, and you've got to be really patient waiting for it to come around, I'd just encourage you to keep trying to learn new setups in the meantime. You know, make make that waiting time productive. Like, that doesn't mean trying to trade something random and new that you don't understand yet, but really focus on tracking it, you know? I was also going to say, go out and live! <laughs> that too, okay, yeah, go out and live. You've been traveling all over the world, I've been traveling all over the world, how do you, traveling you know, some people say, oh, Tim, you're just lazy. You get to travel. Anymore. For me, it helps me, not just because I love traveling, but it helps me with my mindset because it takes me away from this nine to five job type mentality. I see a yeah. lot of people where they're like, okay, I'm going to become a stock market expert 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. every single day. And that kind of sitting in front of your computer, I'm all for testing and trying new strategies. But if I'm in front of my computer too much, I start seeing patterns that aren't there. I start forcing trades because I'm sitting there and I want to make it worth it. For sure. Yeah. So do you agree that traveling or taking time away from the screen is useful? I definitely think it can be useful. Um, not too much time, I'm not saying yeah, like, yeah, yeah, not go too out much. and party like, every day. But. You know, learn, learn your own warning signs, I guess is what I would say. Because for me, you know, it took a while in my career to get to that point where I could recognize like I'm getting burned out, I'm gonna do something dumb. Um, I, gosh, it happened like three or four times where I would take a big loss and then go on vacation before I finally figured it out. And was like, okay, it's time for a vacation before yes. I leave. Yes, so yeah. then you're, you, you pay for the vacation by protecting yourself from that big loss. Right. So it actually pays for itself. Yeah. This is a, a, a very common thing. This is what you guys have to understand. This is not a normal nine to five job. Um, it is you versus you. It's very mental. It doesn't matter whether you made nine million or you've made nothing. 
you have to master your own discipline and you have to try to get in tune with the market that's always changing. And that means that frankly, you have to start to think a little different because too many people, they're like, you know, I, I get pictures from students and they're like, I just want to make $100 a day. And I'm like, no, you don't need to trade every single day. I understand, okay, aiming small, that's a good thing, taking singles, but you don't need to trade every day. And then also you shouldn't trade every day. If you, especially if you only have one or two good patterns, then you're just like, oh, I gotta make $100 a day. Or some people put these goals, like I have to make $5,000 this month. Like, mm, yeah. I prefer a big goal later on, and then it's like, what do you have to do to get to that big goal? And the answer that you inevitably come up with is partaking in one or two good patterns and you know trying to take big gains on those big patterns. Part of, I, I remember this early in my journey um, when I was kind of turning things around. I, I would be going through those days where I wouldn't make the trades and you know it would feel kind of unproductive because it was like, oh, I didn't make money today. And I learned along the way that every month I could really count on, you know, two to three elite setups yeah. where it was something that, you know, I knew I would recognize and I knew I could nail. And so my months became about waiting for those setups. Uh, it, it wasn't, it, you know, I, I didn't have that like week to week pressure where I was like, I've got to make X number of dollars. It was all about, you know, okay, this month when I see that new promotion come out, um, I need to be ready to nail it. Yeah. And, uh, that's, you know, that's really the pressure I'd say put on yourself is, you know, when you see your setup, be ready for it, but don't, and trust that that will get you to your end of month goals. And in the meantime, while you're waiting for the setup, learn your setups. That too. And if there, you know, like some people will say, well, how do you learn setups if there are no setups? That's when you study the past. That's yeah. the beauty of this archive that you and I have created and my other top students have created where we have DVDs, webinars, video lessons. There's so much you can learn from something that was four years ago or five years ago because you learn what his optimal patterns are. You learn what my optimal patterns are. SHMP, it's kind of just funny that we both had the same exact stock as the biggest trade. And then TTCM was pretty big for me too. And that was an OTC multi-month breakout. It was, it was like straight out of the Tim Brittany Trading Tickers DVD guide. Mm -hmm. So learn your setups, study up, understand that this is a marathon and not a sprint. Use this guy for inspiration. Don't try to be exactly like him or be exactly like me. Be yourself. We're all different, but this is proof that this is possible. Like, you know, it's, it's crazy. Like, he's a real person, right? Yeah. It's not a hologram kind of thing. Like, people are like, you hired him. He's an actor. And I was like, what? I'm like, no, I don't hire <laughs> actors. Like, if you look at a lot of my top students, I would hire better actors than like some of these people if I was gonna hire that. But I don't want to because it's real. All you have to do is, you know, ideally wait for the best setups. And while you're waiting, you have to learn that. Definitely. Final words. One um, word of wisdom. One sentence. Just remember to take it slow because I started off, you know, I started off with like $30 gains, $50 gains, $50 losses. Like that's, those are my roots too. Like it's, I didn't start off making $1,000 a trade, $5,000 a trade, whatever. Like, you know, I, I've slowly built my way up there and you know, it's just a long, long process so don't rush it take your time and you know don't feel like you need to be doing more and playing bigger because that's not something you can rush and it's better to start small i have to remind you this because a lot of people say some people start with five hundred thousand they're like oh i'm going to be your next millionaire student i already have five hundred thousand but then they lose big because they don't have the oh, right yeah. mentality it's better to start small and earn your way up Earn your way out of the PDT rule. Learn how to make 30 or 50 or $500, not even just because yeah. of the money, but just dealing with like, okay, here's how I enter position, here's how I exit, here's the position size, and then maybe a year later, you take double the position size because you have more experience in a right. bigger Right, yeah, I mean like assume you're gonna screw up often, especially when you're getting started and you want those to be cheap screw ups because I would not be here if my first account had been even $5,000. I think that would have ended me. Start small, be patient. Thank you again. You got it. Yo, no, freaking awesome. Study up! <laughs> Hey, Tim Sykes, Millionaire Mentor and Trader. Thank you for watching my videos. I hope that they help you. I wanna share everything that I've learned over the years. You can check out more videos right over there. And also click subscribe so that you can watch all of these videos, get that knowledge, and become my next millionaire student. 